So it's my delight to introduce, reintroduce to you now Reggie Blackman, who is the director at City Life of Youth for Christ here in Fort Wayne. And uh, I told him, I said, his, his uh, uh, ears have probably been burning off and on and off since he was here last because his message, God's message through him to me was so impressive to me. And I have passed that on to numerous other people, patients and others who needed to hear that message of hope. Amen. Am I, am I on back there? You guys can hear me all right? All right, I'm going to move this water down to the side there. Excuse that, I forgot my water bottle. Um, but good morning, everybody. It's so good to be with you all again this morning. Um, so many familiar faces at this point, having fellowship with you all on multiple occasions. Um, it is good to now see the faces. Um, last time I, I ministered uh, with you all, um, you guys are all online, and so there was a few of us here, but it's good to actually see um, the faces that are smiling behind masks. Amen. Um, so as I open up, just want to go through pro- protocol and forgive me because I am going to be uh, nervous as I minister the word. So forgive me if I speak um, too fast. I'll try to keep myself slowed down and keep a good pace. Um, but first off, I want to give honor to God, um, to my home church and my bishop, um, Bishop Reginald Blackman. So yes, I am the son of a pastor, just like my man's here, uh, son of a pastor. <laughs> um, so giving honor to God and then to my home church, Laterane Ministries. Um, and then thank you all here at Christ Community Church for the opportunity to speak to Pastor Mike Daling, who I love dearly as a brother and friend. And then, of course, to my lovely wife for the support that she is. Uh, she is here with me today. Uh, to be a smiling face and be able to also give me the critiques when I get home of what I can do better. Amen. <laughs> so praise God for help me. Um, so moving into today's message, um, I messaged, I titled this message, Jesus, Our Good Shepherd. And so if you could turn with me to John chapter 10, John chapter 10. We're going to begin reading at verse 1, and this should be a familiar passage of Scripture with many of us. Um, I know if you're like me, people say that, and then you're like, ah, not just by telling me, but maybe as we get reading, you'll be able to to hear it, and and it'll sound familiar to you. Um, And if we could do me a favor and just stand for the reading of the Word, I'm not going to read the full passage, but I'm going to read verse 1 through 6, then I'm going to pray, and then we can be seated after that. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate the feedback. Look at you guys. All right. So um, John 10, starting at verse 1, and I am reading in the ESV because I, Pastor Mike told me you guys read out of the ESV, so amen. John chapter 10, verse 1. Truly, truly, this is Jesus speaking, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he was brought out of all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning, starting us on our way. For those who are here in this building, Father, thank you for the safe travels here. Father, for those who are listening and watching online, we thank you for their ears being open. Thank you for our hearts being ready to receive what you have for us, God. We thank you, God, that we know that you are the good shepherd and that you love your sheep, Father. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you allow for your anointing to rest upon me as I minister your word, Father. I pray that it not be me on this stage, but it be you that speaks through me, that there may be impact that is left and lasting change that is upon your sheep 
as we hear your voice and we are obedient, Father. I thank you, Father, for the grace that is upon each of us as we are a part of your sheepfold. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. You may be seated. And so, here we are in John chapter 10. Um, and this is the book of John. I love the book of John. It's probably my favorite book in the Bible. Um, and we have Jesus speaking to the Jews or the Pharisees, whichever you want to call them, um, here in John chapter 10. And he's been doing this all along, right? And we know that this is leading up um, to his crucifixion, his death, burial, and resurrection. And so Jesus is in this, in this, in this mode where he's ready to ruffle feathers everywhere that he goes, right? He's, he's, he's all in to saying, you know what, you guys are going to end up killing me anyway, you know, so what do I have to fear? So in John chapter 9, you know, we have the story of him healing the blind man, right? And the Pharisees were asking this, this blind man, like, hey, who did this? Who, who's this guy that, that has healed you, right? And, and you have the blind man saying, hey, it was Jesus. And then you have um, his parents being asked because the Pharisees had unbelief. They had a lack of belief. So they asked his parents, and his parents were fearful for their lives because they were threatened, right, by, by the Jews who were supposed to be the, the people of God of this time. And it's interesting because at the end of that story, you see the blind man have an encounter with Jesus, or you read about the blind man having an encounter, encounter with Jesus and saying, you know what, I believe. And he bows down and he worships the king. We move into chapter 10, right, and now we have this parable that Jesus speaks in. On a, I love that Jesus speaks in parables because it paints such a beautiful picture of the kingdom and as, as we look into chapter 10, we'll see that this is what we call a word picture, which basically is a fancy way of saying that it is words that paint a picture, right? Um, and so we see this word picture, and in this chapter you notice the use of inner imagery of Christ being the shepherd. But it's going to take us a while before we get there, but I'm just kind of laying some groundwork. Um, so a shepherd as we know, is a person who tends to the sheep, right? A shepherd was known in this day as being a very hard worker, lurking, working long hours, day all the way into the night, um, and having a special bond with their sheep, a special bond to the point of even knowing their name. Amen? And we see examples of this all throughout Scripture, right? So if you look at Psalms 21, I mean, I'm sorry, Psalms 23, verse 1, you don't have to turn there. But that psalm opens up with the saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Another way I've heard this said is the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. Right? Um, and so we praise God, the Lord for being a, a provider, right? Matthew 18, verse 10 through 14 is the passage that may be familiar to you talking about how the shepherd leaves the 99 for the one. If there is one sheep that gets outside of the fold, a good shepherd goes after that one sheep to make sure that it can be brought back into the fold or to, to the herd of the rest of the sheep, right? Knowing that that sheep matters just as much, if not more, in that moment than every other sheep that is already where it needs to be, right? And so we're, it's revealing the heart of a shepherd, amen? And so... As we get into, back into our scripture, looking at verse 1, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. So in verse 1, we see that this, the, it talks about the sheepfold. And the sheepfold is basically a pen or, or, or a, um, a surrounding, an area where the sheep go into, right, and they enter into to be kept safe overnight. Um, as we know, you know, you have wolves, you have the thieves and robbers that it's referring to here in, in the first verse uh, of these people who would try and steal from the shepherds, right? Many shepherds would keep their sheep in the same sheepfold um, if they lived in the same village. So it would be a bunch of different sheep, all in this, uh, of different sheepfolds in this, I'm, I'm sorry, all who had different shepherds all in the same 
sheepfold, right? And so you would have a group here, he would have his 15 or 20, another guy who would have his 15 or 20, but they all go into the same sheepfold if they belong to the same village, right? That's going to be important here in a second as I get there. Oftentimes, shepherds would check their sheep in one by one. So a good shepherd, before they went into this sheepfold, they actually inspected their sheep to make sure that there were no bumps, no bruises. Um, sheep are very fragile animals, right? And so they, have, they, they can be easily um, injured, and, and they, had, they, they would have issues or something from being out grazing in the land. And so a, a good shepherd watches over his sheep and checks his sheep in one by one to make sure they're healthy. Um, and then it's important to know that the sheep are known by name. I'm just giving you context here. Because a good shepherd's sheep can't be led astray. It's important to know that a good shepherd's sheep can't be led astray. Shepherds have the privilege or the right to come in and call their sheep and take them out of the fold. And I'll get there. I'll get to why that's important in a second. So verse 2 says, but he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. And this is important because... There would be a person, and you'll, we'll read it, about it in a little bit, um, the gatekeeper, who overnight is watching over the sheep to make sure that those who are in the sheepfold, all the sheep are safe, right, from the robbers, from the wolves, and all that kind of stuff. And so what, what, had, what had to happen is that this um, gatekeeper had to know the faces of each shepherd. And because the shepherds were checked in, or they knew they were locked in with who this, this gatekeeper was, they would know, hey, okay, you can be allowed in because there was a protection. There was a, there was a, there was a reason why this gatekeeper was there. So, so to um, verse 3, to him the gatekeeper opens. I'm sorry, verse 2. But he who enters into the door is a shepherd of the sheep. And verse 3 says, to him the gatekeeper opens. The shepherd hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So the gatekeeper, or also known as a, a porter, right, checks in, the sh- checks in with the shepherd each morning, having watched over them by night. Once the shepherds have been checked in by the door, they must call their sheep by name. Sheep are particular in how shepherds lead them. They're different from things like cattle, where cattle, you can get cattle to move. You know, you may take a whip or you may smack them or something, and they'll get to moving and things like that. But the, the, the thing about a sheep is that a sheep has to be led out specifically, right? And so they're gentle animals, so you have to call them. You have to do things to get them up and get them moving, um, which is different from what a cattle is. So, so a sheep are precious animals that must be... Um, tended to and led out in a gentle way. It sounds like how we in the church oftentimes want to be led, right? We love when a leader can be gentle and, and tend to us in, in the right manner and, and lead us well. And so this is what it's referring to here in, in, as we are um, that example of a sheep, right? And so as we move to verse 4, verse 4 and 5, it says, When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his what? Are you guys following me? All right. I'm just making sure y'all awake this morning. Amen. So verse 4 says, when he has brought brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, and they know his voice, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. For they do not know the voice of strangers. And so here in verse, verse 4 and 5, it's talking about the effort that it takes for a shepherd to get his sheep out of the sheepfold. The pursuit of the sheep to be led out of the sheepfold that is necessary. Right? And so... Like us, when we wake up in the morning, sometimes we may be a little tired, right? It's, we, we're slower to move in the morning. So a shepherd goes in, a good shepherd goes in, and he tends to a sheep in a way to where he's actually doing everything that it takes to make sure that that sheep gets out one by one. And it goes to the next sheep, he'll call him by name and come out, right? Goes to the next sheep, calls him by name and come out. But then what's also important after that 
is that once he goes before them and draws them, I'm sorry, once he goes in and draws them out, which takes effort because the sheep may be tired, may be lazy, may not feel like getting up, the shepherd must then go before his sheep to also lead them out into the pasture. He goes before them to also lead them out into the pasture. As we see in verse 5, a stranger they will not follow. Now the strange, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know his, the voice of strangers. And so here we are. We got a shepherd. And I know it's taken me a while to get into the message, but forgive me. All right, I just want to make sure I paint the right picture. Right, this is giving context before we get into um, later on in the passage. So I've gotten in as a shepherd. I've gotten the sheep one by one, pull them out, and now I'm also going to lead the sheep into where they're going to graze in for the day because I'm a good shepherd, because I care for the well-being of each and every individual that is of my, of my sheep, right? Um, verse 5 says, A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Amen. And so it's good to know that my sheep, when I'm a good shepherd, as a good shepherd, right, not me, but... And here in the, in the, in the passage, it's saying, as a good shepherd, if you shepherd your sheep well, they know your voice and that they will not follow the voice of a stranger. Meaning that when there are lies that are fed to the sheep to try and draw them out, when the thieves and the robbers come in the middle of the night to try and draw them out, try to deceive them, to try and get them to move away from the rest of the flock, that they will not follow Amen. And this figure of speech in verse 6, it says, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. Isn't that, isn't that amazing how people can hear the preached word of God from Jesus himself depicting that his sheep know his voice, as we'll see later on, his sheep know his voice, and yet here they are listening to Christ share and not even being able to understand, not being able to understand and hear his voice. That's amazing to me. And now this is the Jews now, and if you guys know anything about the Jews, the Jews were at this time believed to be the only people that could have true salvation, that could have a relationship with God, right, have this true relationship with God. And so this is who he's speaking to. It's not like he's speaking to the Gentiles, right? Are you supposed to be the people of God here? So verse 7, Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, repeating himself, truly, truly, I say to you, I really want you to get this this time. I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. And here, Christ is alluding. He's alluding to himself being the doorkeeper because Jesus is our protector, our doorkeeper, our protector. Jesus is the doorkeeper, which means that we have to come through Jesus to get into the sheepfold to be safe overnight. When the thieves and the robbers are coming, we have to go through Jesus as the door in order to get to this place of rest, right? Resting in that sheepfold. And so he's saying, I am, I am that. I am that door that you have to go to, through, that you have to be checked through, right? Familiar passage of scripture that we talk about. Let me see if I can find it. In John 14, we read out of John 14 earlier where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through me. Here you see in John 10, a similar depiction as he's calling himself the door that we have to come through to be a part of his sheep. The, the door that we have to come through to receive salvation. You know, we're living in a day and age where people like to say things, silly statements, Silly statements where they say, the Bible contradicts itself. Silly statements where they say, ah, the Bible doesn't make sense. Well, when you read the Scripture, to truly know what the Scripture is saying, what the Word of God is saying, it's actually something that builds upon itself. It's a self-proclaiming book. And we'll see a little bit more about this, but it, 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 it's amazing to me how here in John 10, you, hear, you see Jesus and you hear Jesus saying the same thing that he's saying in John 14, 6, right? And so Jesus, in verse 7, he said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 8, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not 
listen to them. I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is expressing to the Jews that there have been thieves and robbers, but because he is the door, that they don't have access. They don't have access. And we can rest and be comfortable in our salvation, not comfortable in the sense of complacency, but comfortable in the sense of secure in knowing that Jesus is the door, that there is no there is no separation from God, that there is no, there is no uh, voice that can come that has an authority higher than God's in our life because we are his sheep. Amen? That, that as the sheep of God, because he is the door, he is that protection for us. Amen? That he is our filter, right? He is what everything has to pass through in order to get to us. I'm reminded of Job, right? And, and in the story of Job, that the devil had to get permission from God to be able to try Job. That he didn't have a right to God's elect. Amen? He didn't have a right. He doesn't have a right to God's elect that are in this room. Amen? And so um, he is the door, and he has blocked his sheep from hearing the voice of a stranger. Amen? How many of us know that because we have Jesus that when those lies are trying to come, that we are able to pray and say, no, I'm not going to believe the lies. When the voice of a stranger tries to come and cause confusion in the church and in the body of Christ, that we are able to say, I'm sorry, I can't hear you right now. That doesn't sound like my Jesus. That doesn't sound like the word of God. How many of us can, can truly say that we have that confidence, right? Because the word of God is clear here. We don't have to hear the voice of a stranger. That God has, Jesus has, has stand in the gap. He, he has been, the, he is the door that says, I'm going to keep all that noise out. Amen. Because he wants a unified church. He wants a unified, not only building, but big C church, right? To where regardless of where we fellowship, regardless of where we worship, regardless of who we are around, if we are amongst the body of believers, we are all his sheep. Amen. Amen. So verse 10, it says, the thief comes only, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And he, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his own life for his sheep. And so here in Scripture, you see that the thief comes on assignment. Huh. The thief comes on assignment, just like I just shared about Job, came on assignment, right? He got permission and came on assignment to attack the sheep. But the confidence in knowing that we have a good shepherd as Jesus now makes the turn. So earlier he was given a, a depiction of a general, a general shepherd, a general sheepfold right? A general robber, a general thief. And now you see him turn to say, because they, you guys didn't understand that, I'm going to feed you guys a little more. I'm going to go a little deeper now, right? And here he's saying, I am the shepherd. So not only is he the door that we have to enter into and to, to get into salvation, but he is also the protector, right? In the sense that he is the shepherd of his sheep, Amen. How many, how many are grateful that God is a shepherd or Jesus is our shepherd? Amen. Amen. All hands should be raised because he is our shepherd. And so whom shall we fear? Whom shall we be afraid when we have Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, as a good shepherd that protects us? So the, the, the thief comes to steal. And when I see this word steal, I think of not only stealing, but separating us from the flock by trying to feed us lies. So the thief believes that if I can feed a little bit of lie, right, if I can sound like the shepherd, if I can confuse the sheep, right, then maybe I'll be able to do what it says next, to kill the sheep, right? So once I can remove a sheep from the sheepfold, 
Once it's in my hands, once it's in my care, the, th- the thief says, once it's here, the robber says, once it's here, I can now kill the sheep, right? And so to kill us by deceiving us until we become dead spiritually is what the thief tries to do. Tries to first steal us from the sheep fold, right? Then tries to kill us and causing us to be dead spiritually. I know I, know I have some friends who for a period in time seemed like they received the gift of salvation, went away from the church, and all of a sudden it seems like they are dead spiritually, like they can't hear the word of God, like they can't hear the voice. I know some of you guys may have the same testimony. You can, you can see people who was like, man, I remember when you were part of the this, this sheepfold. I remember when you had that confidence and that boldness in your faith, and all of a sudden what has happened where you can't, truly see or hear the Word of God and and apply it to your life. You can't truly hear and see the Word of God and make a lifestyle change and walk in obedience because they have been deceived by this thief, by this robber. And then to destroy, to get us to the point of no return. So that's what, that's what, that's, that's what the, when the thief comes on assignment, to kill, to steal, I'm sorry, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And ultimately that destruction is leading us to a pathway, as we know, to hell. Eternal damnation, right, to destroy us and get us to the point of no return. But there's good news. There's good news. Because in verse 11, Christ expresses what he desires for his sheep as he is the good shepherd. In verse 11, in verse 11 it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The thing about a shepherd, a good shepherd, is that no wolf is evil enough. No robber is evil enough. No thief is evil enough to the point where That shepherd is not willing to lay down his life. And we know that Jesus is alluding to himself being on that cross that we see up here. And I love how this cross just keeps going in a circle that it's like it's eternal, right? It's a circle. As I was watching, I was like, man, it connects all throughout the sanctuary and and, and it's eternal, right? So he's alluding to himself and the death that he will suffer on our behalf because he is a good shepherd. The suffering that he is willing to endure because he is a good shepherd and because of his relationship with the Father. So he saved us from being stolen, from being killed, and from being destroyed. And we would even go as far to say this because we know this he saved us from ourselves. He has saved us from ourselves, ultimately, from us getting in our own way, from us standing in our own path, from us competing against our own will, right? And he has given this gift and says, you are my sheep. I know you by name. As we saw earlier in the passage, I know your name and you are my sheep. And so I am your protector and I've protected you with my life. So we praise God for being a protector. Verse 12 says, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I praise God that he gives us Jesus and not a hired man. (laughs) Because that don't sound like security to me. That doesn't sound like safety. That doesn't sound like a place that I could rest in. A place where a hired hand sees danger. And there's some churches, that it's unfortunate, but we have some churches who have people who are supposed to be shepherds of the church, who are supposed to be watching over the church, 
but aren't in it for the right reasons, that manipulate the congregation, that manipulate people. But then we have great churches like this one who have good shepherds. Amen? Like Pastor Mike, who's being used by God, who's standing in that gap, right, between the church and, and Christ himself. He, he is standing in that gap, amen, and being used by God as a shepherd here, amen, and doing an awesome job. Jesus is calling out, in verse 12, Jesus is calling out the people who are hired to work with the sheep. He is referencing people that are not called to shepherd flocks, but are pretending to do so. Mm. They will quit when danger arises because they don't truly love the sheep. They are in it for the love or need of money, the love, the need of feeling affirmed by people, of being self-centered, self-loathing. In the King James Version, it translates that the wolf comes and catches the hired man. So I'm sure if you, if you paint this picture, and I don't want to over, over, over uh, do the story, but you have the hired man who sees a wolf coming and, I, and thinks that he's leaving to get away and doesn't care about the sheep. But in the King James Version, it actually says that that hired man ends up getting, getting caught by the, by the wolf. Ends up in the same predicament as those sheep who become unsafe and unprotected are in. And then the wolf scatters the sheep because they're lost. They need to be led, as we talked about, when they're in the sheepfold, they need to be led. And so in that, in that moment of chaos, they're lost. And this is similar to the effect of what happens in Ezekiel. So I want you guys, if you could, turn with me to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 34. And I actually meant to read this earlier, but I got caught up. Ezekiel 34. I'm going to try and read through this quickly. And can you let me know how am I on time? Where are we at on time? Okay. All good? Okay. I, you know. I just want to make sure, I, you know, amen. Um, so Ezekiel 34, and, and what I'm finding out is that I, I really enjoy the prophet Ezekiel. He was a man that was used by God um, very powerfully. But Ezekiel 34, I'm not going to go into too much. 34, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord, Lord God, all shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves should should not shepherds feed the sheep. You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. Now, I, talk, I told you guys earlier what a good shepherd does, how a good shepherd leads your sheep, how every time they go into the sheepfold, they're, they're observing each, each sheep one by one, right, and making sure they're tending to them well. So there's a depiction in, in, in John 10 that tells us how the sheep are to be led. And here the prophet Ezekiel is telling the so-called um, shepherds of the Israelites, or, or, or um, he's telling them that this prophecy is coming to pass because they have not done these things. So Um, I'm going to jump down to verse 7. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts since there was no shepherd and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, the shepherd, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths. Uh Uh-oh, hold on. Jumped around on me. Let's 
sorry. Um, what was I? What verse was I in? Ten. Uh, nine, eight, seven, six. Um, Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God: Behold, I am against the shepherds. Um, yeah, and I'm a, okay. I'm, I'm trying to move through this, so I'm gonna jump down to verse eleven now. For thus the Lord. So this is broken down in sections. This prophecy is broken down in sections. So the first, the first six verses, right? He's addressing the shepherds and how they've how they've interacted. Um, he explains the sins of the shepherds of Israel, right? And so you guys didn't tend to the sheep. You guys weren't paying attention. You guys weren't, weren't protecting them. You left them out to the wolves, right? In verse 7 through 10, it talks about the judgment that is to come, right? And then verse 11 through 16, I won't read it. I won't read all the way through it for the sake of time. But I encourage you to go back and read it, right? Go back and read Ezekiel 1 all the way through verse 24. But 11 through 16 says... It's talking about how God is going to go searching for his sheep himself. God will go searching for his sheep himself. And then 17 through 19, God questions the sheep before judgment because what he notices is that he has to judge each sheep individually because some of them became fat. Some of the sheep became bullies of other sheep, right? And instead of everybody being able to eat together, I'll, I'll read, I'll read. I'm going to jump to verse 9, 17, I'm sorry, verse 17, because I want to read that part as well. So as for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Is it enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture to drink of clear water, that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet. And so here it's talking about people, the, the, the sheep within the flock and how they've treated other members of the flock. See, we oftentimes want to put the judgment on, oh, the pastor up there, he's not doing this or he may not. Well, this is clear that we as, as the flock also have a responsibility to how we conduct ourselves within the body within the flock, amen, that we should conduct ourselves with a tongue that is speaking life unto one another, with a tongue that is, is, is willing to speak the word of God, amen, and, and convict one another, but then also speak the truth in love and love one another really well. And the actions that should be taken up that cause for us to be a, a unified body, amen, the cause for us to, to walk with each other and, and agree on things rather than disagree, right, to use the approach of not this versus this, but this and this. Not vaccinated versus non-vaccinated, but vaccinated and non-vaccinated. Amen? And we live in a world where we're trying to paint this picture of one versus the other. It's not Republican versus Democrat. It's Republican and Democrat. Democrat and Republican, right? Libertarian and Republican and and whatever else, uh, conservative and liberal, right? Now, we, uh, obviously, we know that there are things within all of it that we have to be mindful of and use wisdom and use the Word of God as the highest authority, but I just wanted to touch on that real quick before I moved on. Amen. Amen. Because we don't want to be deceived. We don't want to be deceived. And so verse 20 to 24 in Ezekiel 34, you'll see that God is bringing judgment over the sheep for those who are not of his fold. So he, he, it talks about there are going to be sheep there, but just like I said earlier, they may be within the sheep fold, but they don't belong to the shepherd. They belong to a different shepherd. And God is talking about the judgment that he's going to bring upon those sheep who don't belong to his, um, his flock. And then verse 24 It's talking about how uh, it's actually a foreshadowing of the Messiah, the son of David, who is to come. So I encourage you to go back and read that. I know I had to jump through it because I don't want to take too much time here. Um, But Ezekiel 34 is a, a great depiction of the state that Israel was in. And now seeing Jesus in his time getting ready to be persecuted, right, the same leaders of Israel... These same Jews, these same Pharisees, 
still doing the same thing that they were doing in the time of Ezekiel. And honestly, there's still people today doing the same thing that was going on in the time of Ezekiel. Amen. But now we have the Lamb of God who has redeemed us from that. Amen. And so, um, let me see, where am I now? Verse 16, back to John chapter 10 and verse 16, John chapter 10, verse 16, I'm sorry, verse 15, verse 15, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 16 says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. One flock and one shepherd. What's significant about verse 16 is that, like I said earlier, up until Christ, the Jews believed that they're the only ones who could be saved. Some would even say that the Jews might have had some prejudice or racist tendencies. Some would say that here we are, the Jews, the called, the elect, but yet they had some of those customs that they had to fight against here that Jesus is saying, ah, sorry, that ain't it. I'm here. That's going to change. I am standing in the gap so that those who are called, who may not have originally been of this sheepfold, of, of this flock, I'm calling them to say, you're, you're good enough because I'm good enough. I'm calling you. You're going to be a part of this. You are my elect, and you're going to be adopted into this. Amen. Christ is making it clear That this is no longer just for the Jews. And the Jewish people, you'll see, were against this message because their enemies, they knew that Jesus was referring to the Gentiles, which were their enemies in a lot of situations, which they went to war with in a lot of situations. He said, "I'm I'm calling reconciliation. Hallelujah. Thank God for his reconciliation. And not only would he call these Gentiles, but he would call them by name. And they would be gifted into the faith and receive the gift of salvation through him. And I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Uh, Trying to wrap it up here. And verse 17 says, For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Verse 18 says, No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the what? Stay with me now. I have the what? To lay it down. And I have the what? To take it back up again. The authority to take it back up again. This I charge, this charge I have received from who? My father. Mm. This authority have I received from my father. Jesus is showing now his deity. He's showing his deity. He said, I'm so in sync, I'm so in tune with my father. (laughs) Let me tell you, I can die when I'm supposed to die, and I'm going to be raised right back up to show that I'm that in tune with my father, that even in death itself, I'm in tune, that I have the authority to conquer sin and death that I have the authority to raise my life back up. That he has the ability to have a dominion over death itself and made it clear that his Father in heaven has instructed him these things. He knew all along that he would be on that cross. He knew all along that he would be up on that cross. That his Father had instructed him he was on assignment. And that it was his job to act in obedience in order for him to be the good shepherd that we all need. To be the good shepherd that we all need. 
And verse 19 says, there was again a division amongst the Jews. Now, this sounds like the same thing that happened in John 9 at the end of that scripture. There was a division amongst the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon. <laughs> tell, him, tell him that Jesus got a demon. Lord, help him. And is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So it's clear that they, they were there and know the story of Jesus healing the blind man. They hear the story of him being the good shepherd, him talking about who he is. And Jesus, our shepherd, divides his sheep from the others. You see it here, that Jesus, our shepherd, divides his sheep from all others. Because his sheep conduct themselves in a way that are being led by him. Mm. And when we're being led by Jesus, we move in a way that shows that we're being led by Jesus. People of God, we should be walking in a manner of unity as a flock that exemplifies being led by Christ, not being led by the world. Amen. Our speech should exemplify that we are being led by Christ and not led by the world. Amen. Because we are the flock. Everybody in this sanctuary right now, everybody online should be able to be saying the same thing as we are all a part of the flock of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to encourage you guys as I wrap up today, I want to encourage you that as you are God's elect, as you are the sheep in his sheepfold, as you are those who have been, been called to steward, be stewarded by God, who have been called to be shepherded by God, amen, through the pastor of this house, through Jesus Christ, ultimately, who God has called for such a time as this, that you walk in obedience as a sheep because we serve a shepherd that has laid his life down. For all of us, he has laid his life down. That we can be safe, not comfortable, but safe and secure in knowing that we have a good shepherd. I want to encourage you as you walk this walk of faith to be strong and courageous knowing that you belong to the flock that Jesus has called. I want to encourage you as I close, lastly, and as we're getting ready to take communion, I want to encourage you to ensure that you know the shepherd's voice, that you know the shepherd's voice. One thing that we have been repeatedly reminding ourselves at my home church is that each person in this room each person that is a part of the flock of Christ is called to be a theologian. We must all know the word of God and be able to properly articulate and discern what God is saying when his scripture says what it says. We must all know the voice of our heavenly father because of the intimacy that we have with our good shepherd. We must all be able to say, I heard clearly from the voice of God, and I know that I am where I'm supposed to be. That when I'm speaking to my neighbor that does not know Christ or my neighbor that may not exemplify Christ, that I'm able to have the boldness, I'm able to have the wisdom and wherewithal to say, if you are his sheep, you know his voice, and you know that the word of God has the highest authority in your life. I want to encourage you to know his voice and not only know his voice, but to act in obedience to the voice of God, as his scripture tells us. Amen. Give the Lord a clap offering. <laughs> Father, I thank you for your word that is sharper than a two-edged sword, that is able to pierce the innermost parts of our hearts, the innermost parts of our being. Father, I pray that these words take root 
and produce good fruit in its season. Father, I thank you for your word that tells us that you are our shepherd, that you love us, and that you've laid your life down for us, and that we may steward that laying down of your life by acting in obedience according to your word, and by doing that we may hear in those final days, well done, thou good and faithful servant, in Jesus' name.